Hello, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about a complete linear programming hierarchy for linear codes. So let me start by briefly reviewing uh, some basics of coding theory. So in coding theory, we are particularly interested uh, with the following problem. We want to send a message through some, some channel that possibly has some noise and might corrupt our message. And the idea is very simple. Uh, instead of using all possible bits for my message, I'm going to restrict my attention to some subsets of all possible uh, strings of n, n, like n length strings bits. And this is called a code. So it's a subset of all possible strings. And we are mainly interested in two quantities of these codes. Uh, the first is the rate, which is very natural. It's, it's measuring how much information I have per bit. So that's just the log base two of the size of the code divided by n. And the second is the distance of the code, which is the, just the minimum distance of any two different code words in my code. And distance here is the Hamming distance, so it's the number of bits that they differ. Now, uh, distance here is kind of measuring the robustness of the code uh, through, through corruption, because if I receive some code word and I know that at most uh, le uh, less than distance over two bits got corrupted, then I can just look at the nearest code word that is valid, and I would know that that was the correct code word that, uh, that was sent to me. So, of course, here I'm saying you could just look at the nearest one, whether you can do this algorithmically fast or not is a very interesting problem in its own right. But here we're going to just be concentrated on the theoretical part of whether this is how large can the code be while uh, I still have some robustness. So in a very simple question, how large can the rate be while the distance is still large? And this boils down to these two quantities, right? So A2 and D. Uh, is just measuring the size of the best best possible code of distance at least d, and r2 delta here is the best asymptotic asymptotic rate of of uh, of a code that has distance at least delta n. And as you might expect from the title of the talk, oh, I should say that our regime we are particularly interested in the regime where d is delta times n for some constant delta that's between zero and one half, because above one half, the codes that survive are very tiny. So, so it's, it's a linear distance. Now, from the title of our talk, uh, you might expect that we are particularly interested in linear codes, and these are just linear subspaces of these, this finite vector space. And in this case, the distance, uh, there's a much easier way of computing the distance, which is just the minimum Hamming weight of a non-zero cold word. So, so it's just the number of bits that are, are non-zero. OK, so what do we know? What are the classic results of the literature? So in the 50s, Gilbert showed that random codes are pretty good. So if you um, insert code, code words in, into your code with a certain probability and you play around with the parameters, you can see that you can attain uh, distance uh, delta times n with a code that has rate roughly one minus entropy of delta. Uh, so entropy here, the binary entropy. Uh, a little bit later, Varshamov noticed that you can also do this with linear codes or random linear codes. So if you pick uniformly at random a generating matrix for a linear code and you adjust the dimensions appropriately, you're going to get a, a linear code with uh, relative distance delta that has rate one minus entropy of delta. Now, on the other side, of the bounds, uh, the best upper bound that we have, at least asymptotically, is called the LP bound uh, due, due to Macaulay's, Rodemich, uh, Runcie, and Welch. And it gives, gives this strange function. So it's entropy of 1 half minus square root of delta 1 minus delta. And just so that we have some idea of how these, these uh, quantities look like, uh, there is a graph here. So this, this purple line is the GV bound. So below this, we know that codes exist with these, this, this choice of distance and rate. And this green line here uh, is the MRRW bound or the LP bound, if you will, which means that above this line, nothing actually exists with this, with this distance and rate. And in between, we don't really know. So the question is how do, what, what happens in, in between these two curves? And we are particularly interested in, in, in this uh, side of, the, of this graph. Uh, so delta is 1 half minus epsilon for some very small constant epsilon. And in this case, uh, this is roughly what these two bounds look like. So the GV bound looks like epsilon squared, and the MRW bound looks like epsilon squared log 1 over epsilon. So 
If you believe that the GV bound uh, is the correct one, which there are many people that do believe that that is the correct one, you need to find a way of removing this log one over epsilon term. Okay, so let me dive a little bit deeper into the LP bound because our hierarchy is actually going to be a generalization of that. So the LP bound is based, uh, is part of a family of bounds known as convex uh, optimization bounds. So the idea of these kinds of bounds is you come up with a convex optimization problem such that each code gives a feasible solution to this problem. And it's typically a maximization problem. So this means that if you look at the optimum value of this uh, problem, it's going to be an upper bound for the size of the code. So here's what the, the LP bound comes from. It comes from the Del Sarti linear program, which is this linear program here. Uh, and the intended solution or the solution that comes from codes is what is sometimes called uh, the weight profile of the code or the distance profile of the code, which is this quantity here. So if you're going to uh, evaluate it at i, you're going to look at how many pairs of code words are at distance i, and you divide that number by the size of the code. So let's just check that some of these constraints are satisfied. So for instance, A0 is equal to one. This is very easy because for them to have distance zero, it needs to be of the form XX. So you have something like size of the code divided by size of the code gives you one. Uh, AI is equal to zero for I between one and D minus one. That's also easy because our, our code is assumed to have distance at least D. So, so no, no, code, no pair of code words can have distance between one and D minus one. Now you have these Mac Williams inequalities, which I'm not going to cover now, but I'm going to cover later. And the final one is also trivial because, because these things are counting things, is certainly not negative numbers. And finally, notice that the objective value here, when you sum all these quantities, uh, this corresponds to dropping this, this constraint here. So you get something like size of the code squared divided by size of the code. So the, the final value is size of the code. So this means that the optimum value of this linear program is certainly an upper bound for the size of the best possible code of distance at least d. Now, uh, what I want you to pay attention to is that this kind of, uh, th this linear program is particularly studying interaction between two points, right? You're looking at two code words, looking at their distance and then uh, counting how many guys have a certain distance, right? And it's very natural because you know the, the distance itself of the code is based, all, based off of uh, interaction between two points. But you could ask whether studying interaction between more points could have more information that the convex optimization problem could use to drive down the, the optimum value. And indeed, people have studied that. So Shriver um, came up with a semi-definite program that was studying three-point interactions. And it turns out that it's slightly better than the Del Sarti OP. Uh, by slightly here, I mean that you can run some numeric values and, and you can see that it's actually better from Del Sarti OP, but we don't know if it actually improves the LP bound asymptotically because nobody was able to analyze it yet. Uh, later on, uh, Gishwit, Mitterman, and Shriver again uh, also did a, a four-point interaction STP. And that, that prompts the question, can you do an arbitrary number of, of points, like interaction between an arbitrary number of points? And indeed you can, people have done this. But before I get into that, let me uh, briefly remind a couple of concepts of convex optimization. Uh, namely, uh, notice that uh, if you think about it for a second, uh, the problem of codes can be stated in the language of graph theory, because you can just think that you have a graph such that the vertex sets are all possible code words, and you put an edge every time two code words have distance less than d. Then it's very easy to see that a code of distance at least d is nothing more than an independent set in this graph. So you can use any kind of, of bounds that is provided by convex optimization for the independence set and for this particular graph. One that's going to be very important for us is uh, the Lovis theta prime function, which is this uh, particular semi-definite program. Now it's not that important uh, what this looks like. Uh, what is more important is that there's a result by Shriver that says that the Del Sarti OP is actually equivalent to this theta prime function. Uh, namely, uh, if you look at this graph, it actually has a lot of symmetries. Uh, for example, uh, if you, or at least if you look at this program, 
you have a translation symmetry. There is, if, if you translate both of the coordinates by the same uh, code word, you're going to see that the, this preserves uh, the feasibility of the solution. And the, another kind of symmetry that you have is permutation of bits. So you have n bits. If you swap around the, the bits, then of course, it's a, this is completely symmetric because at the end of the day, the distance only counts how many of them are non-zero or, or are different. So you have the symmetry on the problem. So this means that you could factor out the symmetry out of the theta prime. And once you do that, it's, it's very nice because you now consider solutions that are symmetric under this action. And it turns out that these such matrices are necessarily in a very specific matrix algebra called the Bose-Mesner algebra. And what is nice about this Bose-Mesner algebra is that it's a diagonalizable algebra. In other words, it, this means that it doesn't matter what is the, this matrix that lies on the algebra, you know exactly what are going to be the eigenspaces of this matrix. So you can just look at what are the eigenvalues on these eigenspaces. This means that this semi-definite constraint turns into a linear constraint because you could just take any vector on that linear space and check whether its corresponding eigenvalue is actually non-negative or not. So that, that tra transforms the SDP into an LP. That's how these two guys are equivalent. Now, building on this idea, Lohan actually said, well, there is a very nice hierarchy in, in convex optimization that gives you better and better upper bounds for independence number of graphs, which is called the Lasser hierarchy, or also known under the name sum of squares. So in our graph still has the same symmetry. So the Lasser hierarchy will inherit the symmetries from the graph. So we could try to factor out these symmetries. And the nice thing about this hierarchy is that at level L, it really is studying L point interactions. And there's more things that are nice about this thing is that the, it's, it's a hierarchy that's getting better and better. So the only disadvantage is that, you know, just as in the usual theta prime, if you don't factor out the symmetries, the, the hierarchy is pretty bad because the graph is pretty bad. It's already exponential size. But it turns out that after factoring out these symmetries, the at least in constant levels of the hierarchy, there is only polynomially many uh, constraints that you need to put and polynomially many variables. So it becomes a polynomial sized hierarchy. So it's a very good hierarchy to, to run numerically to, to get specific bounds. And another thing that is very nice is that, okay, if you don't restrict to constant levels and you would allow to go arbitrarily high, uh, results from convex optimization say that actually, this hierarchy eventually will see the correct value. They, they will see what is the precise size of the best possible code because the, the hierarchy is known to be complete by level two to the end. In fact, even earlier than this. The disadvantage is that when you factor out these symmetries, the same problem that, uh, the same problem that we had on, on Shriver uh, three-point interaction and four-point interaction happens here. You don't actually get this magic of the Bose-Mesner algebra, and you still have an SDP on your hands. You don't have an LP. So uh, our work is actually to address this problem. And what we're going to do is we're going to produce a hierarchy of linear programs that is complete and that is very much, uh, it looks very similar to the Del Sarti hierarchy so that we have some hope of analyzing. So if we only wanted an LP hierarchy that's complete, we could just do something like Shirley Adams that's already there, but Shirley Adams is still not that easy to analyze. We want something that looks like the Del Sarti LP because then maybe we have some hope that uh, techniques similar to MRW and other techniques that have appeared in the literature to do the LP bound can be applied to this new hierarchy. So that, that's a, that is basically our work. Uh, I should also say, as you expect from the title of this talk, there is a small disadvantage to our hierarchy, which is it really only going, it's really only going to work for linear codes in the sense that you can define the hierarchy for non-linear codes, but it will only be complete for linear codes. And we will see what I mean by that. Now, how do we go about uh, defining this hierarchy? So, First, recall what, what was the Del Sarti LP. We want something similar to that, right? So the Del Sarti LP was studying these two-point interactions, and it was relying on these McWilliams inequalities, which I didn't get into much details, but at this point, it's, it's just enough to look at how, how the things look like. Now, for us, we're going to try to, to study interaction between more points. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to define the L configuration of a certain tuple of words. So we're, we're now studying interaction between L, L points, or rather the configuration keeps track of information about L points. And what does it do? It says, well, it's, it's some function from uh, subsets of one through L to the natural numbers. And when you evaluate it at a certain set, it gives you the Hamming weight of the, the sum of the corresponding code words. So for example, if I evaluate it at the set one, three, seven, what you have to do is you take the first word plus the third word plus the seventh word, and you do the Hamming weight of the result, and that's the result of the function. So what this, this, this configuration is keeping track of is all possible Hamming weights of all possible code words in the linear span of this tuple. That's what it's keeping track of. And uh, as you might expect, uh, we are going to look at the configuration profile of the code, which is just the count of these configurations on our code. So you look at all possible pairs of L tuples in the code, and you look at the configuration of their difference. So you do x1 minus y1, x2 minus y2, and so on. That gives you an L tuple. You look at its configuration. It is some function. So let's count how many such tuples some, how many such pairs of tuples give you a configuration equal to some G? And that is the configuration profile, profile of the code. Uh, for each G, it gives you this, this count. And our hope is that we want to prove some sort of higher order Maclean's inequality. We're going to define some crotchet polynomial that is indexed by configurations and it's evaluated on configurations. And when you do this linear combination of this um, configuration profile, as long as it comes from a code, it's always something that's non-negative. That's what we're hoping to prove. Okay, so, but before we actually get into details of what are these higher order crotchet polynomials, let me just show you how the hierarchy is going to look like. It's going to look like uh, something very similar to the usual those RPLP. So you're gonna maximize the sum of all uh, the variables corresponding to all possible configurations. Uh, the configuration, the variable of the configuration zero is required to be one you have some forbidden set, which I'll tell you in a second what it is, and it's going to be non-negative and you're gonna have the Maclean's inequalities. And as you would expect, the intended solution is this, is this configuration profile of the code. And let's check again that most of these inequalities are satisfied or most of these constraints are satisfied. So A0 is equal to one is very easy because only things of the form XX survive. So you get something like uh, C to the L divided by C to the L, which is one. Um, it's certainly non-negative quantities because they're counting things. Uh, there will be the Maclean's inequalities, which we'll see in, in just a moment. And what about the forbidden set? Well, the forbidden set, we have to think about it for a second. So I take two tuples of code words in my code, and my code has distance at least t. And then I take their difference, right? Now I have a, a tuple of code words such that each of the code words is a difference of two guys that are in my code, right? Well, my code has distance at least e. So this means that each of each of the code words in this resulting tuple either is a zero code word or it has Hamming weight at least e, which means that the co corresponding configuration, if I evaluate it at a, a singleton set, there is a set of cardinality one, that corresponds to evaluating only the Hamming weight of one of these guys. And these, this Hamming weight either is zero or more than d. So this means that whenever I see a configuration that doesn't satisfy that, that means there is some singleton coordinate with value between zero and D, then there should be a constraint that says, you know, the count of these guys is zero, right? Because this is satisfied by, by codes of distance at least D. So that is the, the forbidden constraint. Now, before we proceed, let us note that if, if the code is linear, actually there's an easier way of computing this uh, configuration profile, instead of counting these pairs of tuples of code words, you can just count the tuples in the code that have configuration G and you get the same quantity. This is just a change of variables in translation. And this is actually very useful because for linear codes, you can actually add even more restrictions. Uh, in fact, for linear codes, um, imagine that you would have a configuration such that some, some coordinate of this configuration indexed by some set that is not necessarily a singleton has a value between zero and D, right? This means that if for our particular linear code, you're saying that, well, I'm trying to find a tuple of code words such that if I add 
a certain amount of them, I get something of Hemingway between zero, strictly between zero and B. That is nonsense because my code is linear. So any kind of combination of code words that I take in my linear code is going to be a code word. And because it's a linear code, it's required to have Heming Heming weight either zero or above or equal to B, right? So in fact, for linear codes, you can put this better set in this in this restriction here. And this is going to be it's, it's going to make a huge difference for the hierarchy using these extra restrictions. Okay. Um, now let me tell you what are these Crotchet polynomials and the McQuillan's inequalities, and let's start with the with the base case. So, so this is the usual uh, McQuillan's inequality. So it was this linear combination, and the Crotchet polynomial is this alternating sum of products of binomials. Now, for us, it's going to be more convenient to use a different formula for this guy, which is this formula here. So what you do is you sum over all code words of weight exactly i the character of uh, y evaluated at any code word that has weight j. And it doesn't matter which code word of weight j you, you, you use, you always get this quantity. So that, that's, that's kind of important. And our hope is to prove this lemma, right? That we have the analogous thing, but for L configurations. And the higher order project polynomial is going to be based off of this formula for the, the base case. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, if you want to evaluate the H polynomial on G, you sum over all tuples of words that have configuration H, the character of Y evaluated at any tuple of words that have has configuration G. And of course, uh, at some point you need to prove that it doesn't matter which tuple you choose, you always get the same quantity. Uh, and this is proven, but I'm not gonna prove it, prove it here. I would rather actually prove this lemma because the proof is actually very simple, very short. I can even do it in a single slide. So here's the proof. So here I just copy the, the, the definition of the Crotchet polynomial, just uh, rewrote uh, slightly by saying the Crotchet polynomial evaluated the configuration of a couple of words X is just this sum of characters. Well, this sum of characters is essentially doing a Fourier transform, right? There's a, a certain set and because you're only summing over the set, it's just the Fourier transform of this, uh, of the indicator of the set, except for some normalization factors that don't really matter too much. So, so that is a very simple observation. And we are interested in this quantity here, right? You want to prove that this is uh, no negative. So if you open up the definition of the configuration profile, you're going to see that you get the sum over uh, a pair of tuples of code words uh, that are required to be in the code and you evaluate the crotchet at the configuration of their difference. Now, if you do some very basic algebraic manipulation, you notice that this is just the inner product between this, this, this function and the convolution of the indicator of the code uh, to the L with itself, except for some leading uh, uh, normalization factors. Now you apply Parseval, and once you apply Parseval, uh, these things are Fourier transforms of each other, except for some normalization factors. So uh, when you apply Parseval, you get in the care of this particular set of things that have configuration H times, uh, well, the Fourier transform of this becomes the square of the Fourier transform of this, right? Uh, so now it's obviously non-negative because this is a square and this is a non-negative function. So it's obviously non-negative. So that, that concludes the proof. So it's a very easy proof. And in fact, this is just a, it's the same proof of the usual McWilliams inequalities is just done in, the, in this higher order level. Okay, now before I proceed to the, the main results, let me just point out some other properties of these Crotchet polynomials. So first, we do have an explicit formula that looks like an alternating sum of, now it's multinomials is even more complicated. So it's this complicated formula, which I'm not gonna get into details. The only thing that I want you to, to notice is that if you use the previous formula, you would have a sum that would have to look essentially at all possible tuples of code words. So it would take exponential time. This formula is much better because at least if L is constant, it's a polynomial uh, time formula because this sum here is actually, there's polynomially many, many terms here, assuming that L is constant. So that's what I want you to get out of this explicit formula. Now, just as the usual Crotchet polynomials, there are some orthogonality relations for these higher order Crotchet polynomials. There are some reflection relations for these higher order things. And there are also some recursive relations. There, there are some recurrence relations that, that they satisfy, which I'm not going to get into details. And the reason why all of these hold is because actually, 
If you know a little bit about association scheme theory, the crotchet polynomials are what are called Q functions of the Hemming scheme. And this higher order crotchet polynomials, they are also the Q functions of a different association scheme that whose base set is, is this larger uh, cube uh, that, that has is cube of L tuples of N code words. And if you don't know what's association schemes, uh, don't worry too much. What I want you to, to get out of this is that that result that I mentioned before from Schreiber that the Del Sartre LP was equivalent to the theta prime. This is actually true for general association schemes. So this is also going to be true for us. So there will be a particular graph that you can define, which you can even guess what it is. It's not that hard, uh, such that our LP is actually equivalent to the theta prime of this, of this graph. And it's going to be important for us. And, and uh, you know, you're factoring out some symmetries here. Okay, so let me now uh, state the main results. Uh, and as you might expect from the title of the talk, the first main result is that this hierarchy is complete. So here, th this theorem is just saying that it's approximately complete in the following sense. If I give you some precision epsilon and you look at a level that is you know, roughly n squared uh, and some, some other factors based on the precision, then, well, we already know that uh, if you take the LF root of this uh, hierarchy, you get uh, an upper bound for the linear codes. Now, this theorem is saying, in fact, this upper bound is quite good. It's only far away but a by a very small multiplicative factor from the true value of the optimal code. Now, let us also notice that, you know, being far away by a very small value is actually good enough because we know that the, the true value is going to be an integer. So if the precision is sufficiently small, you can say, okay, it's something between uh, 10 million and 10 million 0.5, then it needs to be 10 million. And in fact, in our case, uh, you're looking at linear code. So, so in fact, you know that it's going to be a power of two. So even this example is not even a good example. Now, as I said, uh, this is, this is true for linear codes so when you add those extra restrictions. If you don't add those extra restrictions, uh, actually the, the hierarchy is pretty bad. It completely collapses. You can prove that uh, if you're doing the non-linear version of this, where you, you keep the base restrictions, then the optimum value stays the same. It doesn't matter how high of a level you go, it has the, exactly the same optimum value. Now, I will not get into details about this collapse theorem, even because the other theorem is much more interesting. I will give you some very vague sketch of, of how do you prove this approximate completeness. So, so here is the sketch. So first, uh, remember that, as I said, there is some association scheme uh, going on in the background. And Shriver says the LP is equivalent to the theta prime of the corresponding graph. And the corresponding graph here is the graph over L tuples of code words such that you put an edge every time the configuration of the difference is in the forbidden set for the linear codes. Now, now we need to get into uh, a little bit more of details of this theta prime function. Uh, we want to prove that this, the, the optimum value of this is at most uh, you know, the size of the best possible code to the L. So first, remember, it has a lot of symmetry. So without laws of generality, we can factor out these symmetries and consider only symmetric solutions. For us here, you, can all, you, you, you don't even need to factor all the symmetries. You could just factor the translation symmetries, which is what is important is that uh, once you factor the symmetries, um, this condition that says trace is equal to one forces all the diagonal entries to be exactly equal to two to the minus NL. And then because it's going to be a PSD matrix, uh, just by looking at two by two minors, the, the determinant needs to be non-negative. So all other entries in absolute value can only be at most two to the minus NL. So that these are some very trivial observations. Another very easy observation is that this condition of saying the configuration of the difference is a forbidden thing. So when you have an edge, this is equivalent to saying that the linear span of the difference of these tuples gives you a code of distance that is less than D, a non-trivial code that is uh, of distance of, that is less than D. That is the equivalent. So what we're going to do is we're going to count how many pairs are such that their span have dimension, the, the span of their difference have dimension K. And here we only need a very trivial upper bound. So because I'm counting these pairs with the difference, I can just say, well, 
take two to the nl choices of x and just choose y, right, accordingly. So you just choose the difference and then choose x appropriately. So that gives you a leading factor of two to the nl. And for the difference, you need the difference just to, to be an L tuple that spans something that has dimension k. So you can just think that, you know, out of the L positions, k of them will span the space, and all the others need to be a linear combination of them. So this is a very trivial upper bound because out of the L positions, you choose k. On those k positions, you essentially can have any vector. And on the other L minus k positions, you need to have a combination of the, the k vectors that you picked before. So this is a very trivial upper bound. Now, we are particularly interested in comparing this with the best possible code. So if you let k0 be the dimension of the best possible code, then the objective value of this is going to be at most the L infinity norm times the number of non-zero entries of this matrix. Well, for, for a matrix entry to be non-zero, it cannot be such that you know, the span of the difference has dimension larger than k0, because k0 is the maximum possible dimension of a, of a valid code. So you just sum all of these nk's from 0 to k0. And our choice of level is such that when you do the calculations, you get something that looks like 1 plus epsilon to the l times 2 to the k0l. So when you extract l of root, uh, you're going to get the, 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 the result. Now, before I conclude uh, with uh, some future work on open questions, let me just notice that this proof um, really did not use much about distance, right? It was just manipulating the fact that the code is linear and the dimension of the best possible code. And in fact, this is not really crucial. You can use the same proof to, to show that, uh, to, to apply this to other restrictions that are not distance being at least D. You can do things like epsilon balance codes. You can do things like, I only allow a certain, a certain subset of distances to appear. And in fact, any kind of restriction that is of the form, you look at all possible L tuples in your code and you require their configurations to be exactly in a certain set. These are all restrictions that, are, that, that give you a hierarchy that is complete for linear codes. Another thing you might have noticed is that uh, there's nothing, nothing really much special about the binary case. Uh, in fact, you can do this over any finite field. You just need to be slightly careful because over a finite field, you can either count non-zero entries or you can count symbol occurrences. And it turns out that both of them work. You just need to you know, do it twice, uh, slightly carefully. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you don't care too much about completeness and you only care about defining a hierarchy, you can do this in an even more general setting uh, of translation schemes over left R modules. Um, under very mild assumptions, but I'm not going to get too much into details. I'm just going to give you a very simple example, which is you can even do Hamming scheme over more general things that are not fields, uh, but I'm not going to get into details here. Now, let me finish with future work and some open problems. So first, uh, it's not exactly in the paper that we submitted here, but uh, we now know that the hierarchy is actually complete by level n. It's a considerably more complicated proof. Uh, but it is actually complete by level n. And it, it, here it's actually complete, it's not even approximately complete. You, it actually finds the precise value of the best code. Uh, and the vague idea behind it is that there are, when you go to higher levels, you have more symmetries than just the translation symmetries and the permutation symmetries. You also have uh, the action of the general linear group. So if you factor the general linear group along with the translation symmetries, you land on the post set of subspaces of this finite vector space, and you can explore Mobius inversion to, to do some tricks there and actually get completeness by level n. Now, let me just uh, finish with a couple of questions. So first, the question that actually motivated this work is, can we use this to improve the, the, the LP bound asymptotically, right? And can, can we analyze this, this, this hierarchy, right? Because a priori, if we could analyze it by, say, level n, we would know the, the, the precise size of the code. And if, you, if you're thinking of, about how did MRW came up with their LP bound, uh, you could try to do the same kind of thing here. You can cook up the, you, you can just compute what is the dual program and you can try to cook up a very good dual solution. And if it's very good, then it's gonna give you a very good bound. So, so cooking up these explicit dual solutions uh, is a very, very natural uh, problem to work on. Now, 
as I mentioned, uh, this hierarchy is not good at all for nonlinear codes. In fact, it completely collapses. So a very natural question is, can you come up with a structured LP hierarchy that also works for nonlinear codes and, and is also complete, right? Uh, a different kind of question is, well, uh, when you come up with these all these convex optimization bounds, uh, one thing that sometimes you do is you run this on, on the on the computer to see what kinds of bounds do you get out of that. But these bounds, even though they do provide some evidence, they're not very good because they're they are run for a fixed n, right? So a very very natural question, a more abstract but still natural question is. Can you come up with some sort of limit program, a limit convex optimization problem, such that you only input the relative distance and it gives you an upper bound for, for the, the asymptotic rate rather than just the rate at a fixed level n? And finally, uh, as I mentioned, this, this hierarchy can be constructed for general uh, translation schemes. But we don't know how to construct it for general association schemes. And the reason why this would be interesting is because the, the LP bound that I have been discussing here is actually what's called the first LP bound of MRW. In the same paper, they also have a second one. Now, the first one is based off of the Hemming scheme, the Dosart LP of the Hemming scheme, which is a translation scheme. But the second one is based off of the Johnson scheme, which is not a translation scheme. So the question is, if you have something that looks like the Johnson scheme, can you also produce a hierarchy on top of that, uh, that is a complete, maybe it's complete for linear codes, whatever that means. Uh, and, and that is a very, that, that's an abstract question, but it's still a very interesting question. So that's all that I had to say. Thank you all for listening. And th this is a very uh, simple summary slide. If you want, you can pause the video here to take a look. Thank you.